genealogical information. He just bursts on the scene. And you have told you to look for these words. And as you look for these words immediately, then, next, you get this sense that, that Mark, who's writing Peter's memoirs, remember, Mark wants to get Jesus to the cross. He, he, wants, he wants to go there. We'll read later on in Mark that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The, the reason he came. And so we're studying through this now, and I want you to see today is a long passage. We're going to break it up into two installments. Now what that means is we'll look at the first part of this passage today. Next week, we'll have our Haitian pastors in. The week following, focus on the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And then the following week, come back and finish this passage, as you can say, is filled with miracles. <laughs> I want us to think about it in terms of, of miracles as evidence of Jesus' mercy. Miracles as evidence of Jesus' mercy. I would ask you to stand with me one more time as we read the Word of God. I, I want to read uh, this passage, verses uh, 21 through 43. I hope you've got them in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, talk to me afterwards because we want you to have a Bible. We want you to have your own copy of the Scriptures. We, it's, it's, a, it's illegal in a lot of countries to own one, to have one. Not here. Not yet. So get a copy of the Scriptures. Follow along as I read from the English Standard Version. Beginning of verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again into the boat, in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and alive and well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if I, if I touch even his garments, I'll be made well. And immediately the flood, the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl. I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. What have we just read? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May this passage grip us in new and fresh ways to be convinced, perhaps as never before or for the first time in a long time, the mercy that Jesus has for us. A mercy that the psalmist says 
endures forever. Thank you. Please be seated. Think about what's happened in these last few passages. The stormy sea where Jesus speaks, be still. And immediately calm comes over that entire sea region. Then stepping off of the boat, making to the other side, into the Decapolis, the, the area of the garrisons. The demoniac rushes down toward him. What do you want from us, Jesus, Son of the Most High? We plead with you, don't, don't send us into the abyss. Demoniac, encountering Jesus, seated, clothed in his right mind. And I think about, you know, the people came and you would, you would, you'd like to believe that they, and you'd like to believe that we, having seen that, would go, my soul, look, what he's, look how this man is transformed. We must get to know this one. No. They said, leave us. Please leave us. And I've wondered, as I was thinking about that this week, what did they miss? What did they miss out on? This powerful healer comes to their shores. And rather than be amazed and delighted and awestruck, they're filled with terror when he sends those demons into the pigs and the pigs rush down the slope into the sea and drown. What did they miss? Now, I told you we're going to come back to a passage later on where when he comes to this region again, people are bringing the sick to him. Apparently, the, the demoniac, the, the man formerly known as the demoniac, did exactly what Jesus said for him to do. Go and tell friends, family, what great things the Lord has done for you. But he left that region. He gets back in the boat, we're told. He heads back across to the other side from whence he had come. No sooner had he landed, the text tells us, and set foot on the shore, then, then another person rushes at him. This time, not a demoniac. Not a man who, who, who lived life cutting himself, breaking chains, screaming horrible shrieks. No, a ruler of the synagogue. One of the prominent Jewish leaders. One of those men that the common Jewish person would live in jealousy of. Oh, if I could only be like Jairus. When you read about these people, I'm, I'm always reminded of the, of the movie, the, the play Fiddler on the Roof. Would it spoil some vast plan, he asked. If I could be a wealthy man, if I were wealthy, I would be like the rabbis. I would read the scripture. Days on, remember that? The people lived in jealousy of these prominent Jewish religious leaders. This is an unusual passage because he's on the way to perform a miracle and performs a miracle on the way. <laughs> he's on the way to do something intentionally, proactively, and the mere, the mere touch of his garment with faith produces a miracle. Now, as I thought about this passage, like I said, we're not going to get to deal with the Jairus episode today. In a few weeks, Lord willing. I thought, when we come through this, what do I want you to know? I, I want you to know that while it is true that, that Mark depicts Jesus as being singularly focused on his mission, he is never so focused or too busy to stop and show mercy. That's critical. I think sometimes I, and perhaps you found it, we can get so caught up in good activities, religious activities, busyness, that we overlook opportunities to show mercy. I want you, in knowing that, I want, you to, I, want there, I want there to be a feeling that comes along with that, that we are the recipients of this sovereign, compassionate mercy. We've been shown mercy. We were beggars who had no bread, and we were given the bread of life in Jesus Christ, and Oh, we cannot keep it to ourselves. We must share the bread of life. So in the light of that, and knowing and feeling, I want you to do, 
I want you to increasingly develop the tenacity to advance the Great Commission through disciple making. We talked about that a lot here. While at the same time, being sensitive to show tenderness to those around us who could use a healthy dose of mercy. And then I'm going to ask a question in the light of this, particular, this portion of the passage we're dealing with today. Are you a part of the crowd that followed Jesus or have you touched him? There's a difference. My friend R.F. Gates, my mentor, preached this passage not long before he died in February of 2005. Powerful picture. He pointed out that many people pressed in upon Jesus that day. A crowd. Looking at them, you might have said, wow, what a great crowd of followers. But Arif said only one touched him. Only one touched him by faith. And he asked that question. It was a piercing question. Are we just part of the religious crowd that follows Jesus around, follows the things? Or have we reached out by faith and touched him and been changed in that encounter? So I want you to see, I want to start just we're going to break the passage down. It's got, as long as it is, it has nine portions to it. We will, we will not get through all of those today. Lord willing, we'll get through verse 34, four of the nine. But think about it, how it breaks down. First of all, Jesus departs from the area of the Decapolis. We, secondly, a prominent Jew casts himself at the mercy of Jesus. Third, a desperate woman dares to touch Jesus. Fourth, Jesus, Jesus makes a connection between faith and wholeness. We'll stop there because that's what we're going to cover. First of all, Jesus departs from this area of the Decapolis. I just mentioned that to you. He he had crossed again in the boat to the other side. He, he'd left that side earlier and gone to across there. The big storm came up. He lands on the, the shore, steps off in the garrison district of the Decapolis of the Ten Cities. And they wanted him gone. And I wonder sometimes, I wonder if churches sometimes don't make that mistake of Jesus may do something miraculous, so, so out of the box, so, so unheard of. We've never seen that before, never heard of that before, that, that rather than being caught up with awe and wonder, we're caught up with fear and terror and wonder. And it's so unusual, we say, leave. I, I don't, we, we, can't, we can't have this. We can't exist. In other words, Jesus doesn't do what we want him to do, what we expect him to do, so we send him away. I, I just wonder about that, if that happens. I think it does in some places. second thing we see is that a prominent Jew cast himself at the mercy of Jesus. The, the demoniac, by contrast, had, had thrown himself at them, <laughs> identifying him as the Son of God, not holding back on that at all. Son of the Most High. Jairus is a ruler of the synagogue. He's a prominent Jew. He could get himself in real trouble if it, word gets out or if he's seen fraternizing with this Jesus of Nazareth. But you know something? Desperate times make desperate people do desperate things. I would imagine when his daughter was in health, life was rosy for him. He had privileges that no common Jew would know about. He had material possessions that no common Jew would experience. Life was good for Jairus. No doubt he'd already had some conversations with his, with his fellow ruling class about this guy who was turning things upside down, this man who was not approved by them. He had not risen from their ranks and people were calling him Messiah and Rabbi. He'd probably been in on the conversations. But I found through the years that people who can speak dispassionately about, about different things, spiritual things, when life brings a whirlwind at their door and they're willing to be embarrassed if necessary. Brothers and sisters, I've seen it over and over again. I've seen people, now, now I've been pastoring almost 40 years, and I've seen people who would rail against 
the message that I was bringing, when life unraveled before them, I get the knock on my door. Can you help? This is amazing here. Verse 22 and 24 says, One of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, sees him, fell at his feet, implored him earnestly. This is the man that says, Excuse me, Rabbi, uh, you have some time? No. He falls at his feet. Get the picture here. A Jewish synagogue ruler at the feet of this heretic, Jesus. And he's begging him. The text there, the tense of the verb, he's, he's saying, my little daughter is near death. Come, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and alive. Whatever in his intellectual setting of a chap among synagogue rulers evaluating, criticizing, critiquing the ministry of Jesus, he knew what he'd heard. This man has healing power. Come lay your hands on her, he begs. So that she may be made well and live. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been in a season in your life where, where prayer was sort of perfunctory, it was going through the motions, and then, then the crushing providence comes. And you pray differently. You don't pray like you pray at the prayer meeting. You don't pray like you pray at the dinner table. You don't pray like that if you're called upon to pray in the assembly of the people of God. It's very different. It's the agonizing prayer of desperation. But I submit to you, Jesus gladly hears that. Our fine-sounding pulpit prayers, pastoral prayers, may impress others. Jesus is not impressed by how much we say we know when we pray. He's touched by how desperate we are for Him. We're going to deal with that more in a few weeks with Jairus and his daughter, Talitha. The next thing I want us to see, the third thing here is this desperate woman who dares to touch Jesus. We're told this woman, verse 25, had an, a discharge of blood. She, she's been hemorrhaging uh, abnormally. 12 years. It's fascinating, by the way, that she had experienced this malady for 12 years in the, in the little girl that Jesus is going to encounter was 12 years old. And there she is. She's, we're told she's uh, suffered much under many physicians. I, that's, that's an interesting phrase that you can take because there's some of you who've had difficulties and you've gone to doctors and they haven't helped you. In fact, you may be worse off and, you, and you've suffered. You know what it's like to suffer under the care of a physician. In fact, it tells us here that she'd spent all she had. They emptied out her coffers for help, for healing, and was no better but rather grew worse. Here's a woman at the end of herself. She's at the end of her physical ability. She's at the end of her financial ability. Ability. She is probably nearing the end of her sanity for 12 years. Not able to go and mix and mingle in polite social company because she never knew when she'd have to deal with, with this problem she had. But she heard. She heard reports about Jesus, the healing ministry of Jesus. She heard. And she joined the crowd. 
And didn't just join the crowd, she moved up through the crowd. She came up behind him and touched his garment. For here's what she was thinking. If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And brothers and sisters, that is an expression of faith like Jesus had not yet seen in the Gospels. There's the, there's the, gen, the Gentile nobleman, the, the, the officer, who comes to Jesus and says, I have a son who's very ill, but I don't want to interrupt you. I don't want to just distract you. You have much to do. I'm a man under authority. I say to those under my authority, do, and they do. And I know of you, if you speak the word, my son will be healed. A Gentile, that's astounding. And you know what the script tells us? Is he began to go home. Jesus said, I haven't seen such faith as this in Israel. And on the way, he encounters a man who says, your son's healed. And he said, when did it happen? Well, yesterday at such and such a time, the man knows the time that he approached Jesus and said, if you, just, if you would just say the word, my son will be healed. And Jesus said, go, your son's healed. These expressions of faith that are off the chart. And Jesus delights in that, by the way. Oh, yeah, no, make no mistake about it. He cares for, he cares for the, that, that, that character in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the one called Little Faith. We just talked about that recently. That's faith the size of a mustard seed. Faith in God's power to move and to act can see mighty things happen. So it's, I guess we would call this sort of desperate faith. That, and I think we'll see Jesus, if, if we get desperate for him to move, I think we'd see him move mightily. This woman says, if I just touch him. The text says, immediately the flow of blood dried up. She, she was even at that moment hemorrhaging. And having lived with it 12 years, she knew what it felt like in her body. And at that moment, when she reached out and touched his garment, that changed. The bleeding stopped, and she could feel and sense that it had stopped. And that was so different from what she'd known for 12 years, she knew that healing had come to her. And this is beautiful what Jesus does here. In verse 30, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him. That's very fascinating. Because you see, when power goes out from Jesus, it does not diminish him. It's not like, it's not like the, the batteries we use for our microphones and stuff where sometimes it just, they run down. They have no more power. It's not like any other energy source that you and I are aware of, familiar with. When Jesus has power go out from him, he is not diminished in power. But so sensitive is he to the demonstration of healing power that even when he is not the one proactively speaking the word, laying his hands on, he senses power had gone out from him. And then we get a window in where the disciples are in all this. They had seen him heal people by this time. He's had healings throughout Mark. And they think he's talking out of his head because he, he says, verse 30, who touched my garments? Now there's two to three responses going on here. One is the response of his disciples who were the closest ones to him. They, they, they would in, at times sort of become a de facto uh, set of bodyguards to move him through the crowds. And they, they think he's talking nonsense, which tells me that they've not, they've not yet honed in on just who he is. Peter got it at Caesarea Philippi. He was given it by God, making the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But by and large, these disciples are still very confused about who he is because they answer him in verse 31, you see the crowd pressing around you? Yet you say, who touched me? 
They don't get it. You see, if they were tuned in like they should have been when he said, who touched, who touched my garments? Then they would have turned and began to sweep the crowd as well. Because they would have understood that he was talking about something different. Not the press of the crowd, but some engagement that had taken place. He looked around in verse 33, I love this, but the woman knowing what had happened to her came in fear and trembling. In other words, now put your place in this woman's situation. Did she do something wrong? Should she have gotten permission? Should she have been more courteous? Was it, was it wrong for her to touch the garment of Jesus? She fell down before him. She came. And oh, how different things are for her now. She doesn't have to come with any, any sense of concern or embarrassment that, that this issue of bleeding that she has is going to betray her. I want to remind you, by the way, that in the Jewish system, a woman who was who having bleeding issues was considered unclean, should stay out of public. So when I tell you she ventured on this one to, to even go into the public arena, she was going way out of the bounds of what was socially acceptable and, and religiously instructed. But she had to get to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, oh, if, if we would be that desperate, But she comes to him in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Rabbi, I touched you. But you need to know, I, I've 12, for 12 years, I've had this, this problem. Nobody can solve it. No doctor. I'm out of doctors. I'm out of money to pay doctors. I'm... I'm but they, she told me the whole truth. But it's, it stopped when I touched you. It stopped. I'm healed. And the fourth thing I want us to see briefly is the connection that Jesus makes between faith and wholeness. He said to her, that's fascinating. He doesn't say, daughter, You've tasted some of my power. <laughs> Daughter, he says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your disease. Basically saying they're going in peace. Continue to experience the healing. Now, brothers and sisters, you don't teach this passage to say, therefore, if you, if you touch Jesus, then you're all going to be healed. He didn't heal everybody that had a disease when he moved through those people in that day. But he healed many. And he healed enough. And in enough different ways that there ought to rise up in us faith to believe that this Jesus can make me and you and others we know whole. And if we know the deepest problem that our brothers and our, our, our family has and our friends have, it's, it's not necessarily their, their physical sickness. It is the sickness of sin. It's sin sickness. It's, it's that which will kill them at some point in their lives and take them to hell. We must believe that Jesus can make people whole. Do we believe like that? When we pray sometimes, we pray for the, for the sick and the afflicted, and we pray for folks, friends and loved ones of ours who are unconverted. Do we, do we pray because it's right to pray? That's not, that's not a bad reason to pray, by the way. It is right. Men are always to pray, the Scripture says. But does there come along with that? Perhaps you've walked with the Lord 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And you have seen him move in your life, the life of your loved one. You've seen him move in your midst. You know, you know something of what this Jesus is able to do. In fact, you know as you pray that he's able to do exceeding and abundantly above anything that we know how to ask or think. You've, you've been there. But do we live there? This woman moved through the crowd. 
She was not content to be a part of the crowd following Jesus around. She moved through the crowd. She had to touch him. R.F. Gates, analytical question that has to be answered. Have you been content to journey with the crowd near Jesus, learning, listening to what he teaches, hearing what others say about him, what, what they say he's done, or have, or have you had the necessity to move, to draw close in? If I only touch him, if I touch him, he's not here physically for us, but dear people, we can touch him by faith as we pray as we call out to him, oh Lord. We've seen some amazing things that God has done physically in the lives of our families. We've seen some amazing things spiritually that the Lord has done. Let us never become content saying we have seen some things. But rather, let us say, because we have seen these things, because we have felt these things, we must, we must take worship beyond going through the motions. And we must say, oh Lord, when I gather with the people of God, I must, I must touch you. I must extend my farthest extension and touch you. And I don't want there to be anything that stands in the way of me drawing near to you. Because I know the scripture says if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. I don't want to go through the motions of preaching. I don't want you to go through the motions of hearing. I don't want you to go through the motions of singing or giving or praying. But I want you to touch him. To reach out and lay hold and lay claim and I say, Jesus, as the blind man says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. To know the power of Jesus in you or on your behalf for others. I've said this before through the years and the Lord just rebukes me that I don't maintain this favorite pitch I've said this, we desperately need revival. We do. Our country desperately needs revival. But I think until we get desperate for it, we will not see it. As one fellow said years ago, he said, as long as we can live without revival, then we will live without revival. When we come to the point where we say we, can, we cannot go on unless, Lord, you move. And I think what we can hope for and believe is that power will go from him and come upon us. I want that for you. I want that for me. I want us to touch him. Be made whole. Be made whole. And whatever sense that is for you. So, where are you? In the crowd? I mean, really. Those of us who are in, in church wouldn't be found at a distance. We're in the crowd. But are you content to be in the crowd? Or do you want to be continually like this woman? While all those were around him, pressing in to hear what he had to say, watching to see where he was going, physically, physically following him. This one woman came not out of curiosity, but out of conviction. If I don't get to Jesus, 
things will not change for me. My prayer today, if it's not in this setting, but in private devotions, family devotions, in some context, you will draw near to him, experience him drawing near to you, and extend shamelessly, unselfishly, extend to touch him and be made whole. Let's pray.